Okay, praise the Lord. We're going to continue in this uh, lesson as we have for weeks before, and that's we're going to pick up uh, the scriptures in Revelation. And we have, in the last few weeks, we've went, I think, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 last week. And uh, we're going to kind of just give a short lesson in uh, chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation. I entitled this, A Little of Bereshis, uh, with a little of the book of Revelation. In case you didn't know it, today's lesson in the Torah is Bereshis, you know, the beginnings, Genesis, which is always my favorite lesson every year when I do the Torah, because it's so packed full. I mean, you can just pick a hundred subjects, because everything is in the first two chapters of Bereshis. You can find anything and everything in those two chapters. So it's always full of stuff to talk about. You don't have to hunt and look very far for something that you haven't taught before. Not that I ever do that anyway. I have never read my lessons, so I don't know my last lesson anyway. But this week, I thought I would just uh, speak to you just a few words. As I said, it's going to be a short lesson about uh, <clears throat> how the book of Genesis, it's interesting that the, this today is the day that is all over the world is Bereshit is being explored, and, and it's very interesting that we happen just to uh, finish up on chapters 21 22 of Revelation, not that we've done something so orderly and consistently from Revelation chapter 1, but it's interesting that this lesson today is finishing up uh, our first kind of soiree through the book of Revelation. As I said, we're going to have a doctorate in it before we're finished. The, uh, that's my intent. The Lord allows. He, I believe it's he that pointed me this direction, and so I'd only suspect that he'll let up on it until, uh, until he feels me full of what it is that he wants me to. And I'm a slow learner, so it could take a while. So the new earth and the new Jerusalem are now manifest as the completion of God's previous plans. Heaven finally is realized on earth. The Lord's Prayer is finally realized here. Let's read a little bit, chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Well, there you go. Okay, a new heaven and a new earth. And when is this? This is right after the, the restitution of all things has been accomplished. Acts has related to us that that's what the Lord was about. We find this new heavens and new earth. So uh, heaven uh, comes to earth. And it, when it does, and as it does, God, God renews the heaven and the earth. Uh, and this is just after uh, death and hell are cast into Hades or into hell. And then now the whole earth has, has underwent a restoration, a renewal. And you've, you can see that it's extensive and as thorough, as thorough as purging and cleansing can be by fire. In the first verse, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. There was no more sea. And I saw John, the, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So here I have drawn in times past a depiction of this. I have this drawing at home. It's about four foot long. It's a, a depiction of the New Jerusalem descending down from heaven to the earth. And it is from this scripture and a few other scriptures that I have, I have determined that scripture teaches that we don't go to heaven, but heaven comes to us. And since we don't go to heaven when we die, but we go to the intermediate place of death, and that not being in heaven, then therefore we never do experience heaven per se as it is today. For God renews the heavens and the earth, and it is at the time after the fullness of the judgments, and it is when that his bride is still in the heavenly places right above the earth, ruling and reigning with Christ, when God he himself sends the bride 
to the bride and bridegroom. It's the bridegroom now receiving the bride of God in the form of a city. See? It's a form of a city. It's not, it's not the bride, for the bride has been ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years in the millennial reign. But now God has prepared a bride for his bridegroom and his bride. And that is the new Jerusalem or the new city. And it is time now, since the dragon, the serpent, has been put away for eternity, and all pollution and even death are now dealt with, and there is no more, and all the heavens and the earth are now renewed, the word says passed away, atomized, or however you might want to depict it, it is a complete cleansing. Now is the appropriate time to send the bride. And so God directs, he brings himself. What a wonderful sight that God himself would bring this city, this new Jerusalem, to, to the heavens right here above the earth and allow it to set and join itself to the earth by pillar. So and I've also drawn it uh, with pillar and gates. And uh, maybe, we'll, maybe I'll talk about that a little more as I read. So in verse... Three, and I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God. And I want you to note that this is one of the descriptions of the bride of Christ and the new Jerusalem, in that it is also called here the tabernacle of God. So I, I bring that out here in a little bit. I make the point. But note here it's in this verse that it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with who? Men. Now, that's different than from saying his servants. For over in chapter 22, verse 3, you'll find a reference to his servants. But here in this verse, you're going to find a reference in, in chapter 21, verse 3, a reference to men. So here, this perspective here in Revelation chapter 21, the first, almost the whole chapter nearly, up to when it starts describing the New Jerusalem, all of this chapter is reflective of those uh, amenities that will accompany men on the earth when God sends his new Jerusalem. These are men. These are not resurrected men. These are merely living men. And it says what about them? He, God, will dwell with them. He will dwell with them in that he will dwell in the new Jerusalem. That is his tabernacle. And men will dwell without, and they will dwell in the new earth. Verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more tears. There has been no tears for over a millennium in the heavenly realm with the bride. The bride hasn't had tears or sorrow or pain for a thousand years. But now it's men, men in general, men on the earth, men on the new earth. They will have no more sorrow. They will have no more pain. For, for, for the former things are passed away. The former things of what? The former things of the curse have passed away. Death, hell, Satan, the curse has all been dealt with. And now we have a new heaven and a new earth where men are experiencing a new thing. <laughs> the whole thing has passed away, praise God. Verse 5, and he that sat upon the throne, there's a throne in this tabernacle. Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. And he said unto me, John, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. What is this fountain or water of life? Is it some spiritual, mystical thing? Well, no, it's not spiritual or mystical because it's described here in, the, in coming up. There's a full description of this river. And it is this river that he will give of those that are thirst freely. And in here is in my ever so poor drawing, done in about, what, a minute? 
uh, that was simply meant to be a drawing for my own, my own self. Uh, I, I show you this river. That's what this is. This is a river. Okay. And it's in this river that the Lord God promises to these men that thirst. So, yeah, this river of life is a, a depiction uh, of what it is that the Lord is going to give unto those that are athirst. These are men that he speaks to. And now he speaks, this is Genesis through Revelation, verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the, verse 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Verse 9, and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem. So we see that this new city is also called the, the, the bride. The bride for the bridegroom. It's a great city and it's also the bride. Descending out of heaven from God. Verse 11, having the glory of God, and her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had 12 gates. I just drew, drew this wall great and high, and only one gate, okay? But according to the description of this new Jerusalem, this bride of Christ, this sanctuary of God, this tabernacle of God, this city, we have 12, 12 gates. On the east, verse 13, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and the west three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. So below these gates are foundations, 12 of them, that support this massive city, 1,300 or 1,400 or 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles, these massive foundations, pillars. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, verse 14, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the land. Let me just ask you, what's more important, gates or foundations? Gosh, that was quick and easy. I thought there would be some kind of arguing or debate about it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's simple, isn't it? Foundations are more important. You can't have a gate unless you have a foundation if the gate's built on the foundation. So what's preeminent is the foundation. So here you can find the foundation is, uh, is of the greatest importance. And here you can find in the river of life two substances that it represents in this river. In the river we find mercy and justice. Mercy, mercy and justice. Justice relating to the law and mercy relating to the gospel. We're talking about the river of life. Justice, is, justice relates to the law, okay? And mercy relates to the gospel or the new covenant. And I'm relating to you mercy to the foundations and justice to the gates. There's a memorial here to justice for sure. But justice is not the same dynamic in this new Jerusalem as it was in the, in the old heavens and the old earth. Because there's not the same need for justice because there's no more death, sin, hell, Hades, serpent. There's no contamination of any of that. So justice takes on a new form here. It doesn't have a, a guillotine and an axe and a hangman's noose. And 
It doesn't have any of that because there's no retribution because there is no need for it. But, but still, there's a memorial for justice in that every one of these gates have the name of a tribe of Israel on it. But more importantly, are all the pillars that hold up this whole city, which are the pillars of the apostles, the gospel of the new covenant, that has to do more with the mercy of God. Exceedingly important in my mind. So then we go on. Where's the measurement? And then we have down 21. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every, se every several gate was of one pearl. And I heard, I mean, I've read commentary after commentary and thought after thought and teaching after teaching as relates to these, these things. And one thing that I've heard several times is that this is absurd. And I always have understood that the Word of God should always be taken literal unless it's absurd. If it's absurd, you don't take it literal. You look, at, look for its mystical meaning or its typical meaning. But if it's, a, if it's not absurd, absurd you, re, you receive it as literal. Are you with me? Especially if there's no accompanying word to show that it's mystical. Like in some of the scriptures that we've already read, we have seen that the horse sits on the, on the rivers of water. And then there's this explanation by the angel that's brought to John that says that the rivers are representative of the nations of the world. So when there is something that's mystically in the scripture that has to do with the type, there's an explanation. But when you have no explanation, you just have the river, then you can, or you have the gate made out of pearl. We know what a gate is, and it says it's made out of one pearl. Well, I've heard that's absurd. It's absurd because their thinking is that the size of that, what is it, an oyster? The size of that oyster must be unbelievable if it's a pearl big enough for a gate. So they get lost in that thinking when, have they for not forgotten that it's God that has created the heavens and the earth? Is it so difficult for God to create a pearl the size of whatever, New York City? If he wanted to, I just don't understand that this type of reasoning would relate to absurdity as to where you have to try to find a mystical meaning. There's no mystical meaning here. It is a gate. It's made out of a pearl. It's a gate that leads into this city, the city that's real. It's not mystical. It's a real city that comes down. It's those mansions that he goes to prepare for us today that we might be with him someday. It's the real thing here. So I'm just going off on a tangent. And, uh, I saw, and the 12 gates were, verse 21, every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. Lang was one of those that said that. I disagree with him. Verse 22, and I saw no temple therein. Okay, so there's no temple. No temple. This is New Jerusalem. See here? New Jerusalem. We could write on here the bride. We could write on here the tabernacle. Because these are all descriptions of the same thing. The tabernacle of God. And so this city, it, you realize I haven't drawn all the houses in here, okay? But you got to realize there's houses in this city, all right? Real houses of, of spiritual material, but real houses. This I'm just giving you that that is pertinent to the scriptures that I'm reading. And in this, That's right. It, it, the life is found in mercy and God's mercy and justice. And that's why it's depicted here as a river of life. Good for you to pick up on that. It's just one of those branches as to why we go two and three hours instead of one hour, which I'm trying to do all today in one hour. Good luck, huh? I'm going to attempt it. Kathy, that's well said, well thought, truth. I should have a better drawing before you. 
than this, but if, if you can, can get the truth from this drawing, then it will accomplish its purpose. The point that I made in verse 22 that I want you to hold on to is there's no temple. There's no temple in this city. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now, many have taken this to mean that there is no moon and no sun, but we will find in Scripture that there, in verses coming, that there is a moon and that there is a sun and there is a continuation of time in eternity as it relates to men. And so here we find that in the city, it has no need, in this place, it has no need of light. And it's in this Scripture that we find that truth. Verse 24, and the nations, and this is not in the Greek, where the next few words are not in the Greek, and the nations, and then it says, of them which are saved. Of them which are saved is not in the Greek. It goes, and the nations shall walk in the light of it. And the, in the light of what? In the light of this city. In the light of the light of God and the Lamb. <laughs> And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. That's these guys right here. And this guy here, you see this, this gift that he has carried here? This is the glory of the nations he's carrying in. He's bringing it on in. <clears throat> and their honor, their hands are raised. Verse 25, and the gates of it shall not be shut all the day. So you notice I don't have no... No doors on those gates, because those gates are always open. For there will be no night there. In other words, it's 24-7. It's like a 7-11, right? And 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So another thing that we find out about the Lamb's Book of Life, we found something out about it back in uh, Luke chapter 10, where it said, the Lord said, Rejoice not that you have authority over the devil, but that your name is written in the Book of Life. Then we find in the, again in, uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 20, we find that after the, the books are open and the men are judged out of it for all their works, that there is one book that's open, it's called the Book of Life. And if your book... If the, your name wasn't found in that book of life, then you have no access or entrance at all into this place. But the, the positive side of that scripture is that it is an amenity to having your name written in the book of life in that you now can obtain or access into this place that is called the uh, place of life, wherein life is found. So we we see here in the twenty seventh verse that no one that 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 that's name is not that is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life has access to this tabernacle of God, New Jerusalem, the bride, this city. I'll go into that a little deeper. Verse twenty, verse uh, one of twenty two. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of Lamb. Pure as crystal, that's just about as pure as you can get, right? If pure water is healthy water, this is the healthiest of all waters. And what's this say? Out of the throne of what? This is significant. Out of the what? And? And? Okay, so now we're, we, we have a, a significant thing change here. We have in this city, we, in this new city, we have no temple, but we have a throne. We have a throne wherein is both God and the Son, both the Father and the Son, both God, Yahweh, and the Lamb. They're, they're on the throne together. Universal. God and the Lamb. Now this, you might take this back, to you. this may take you back in your thinking to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it says that 
It says that uh, when, when at this time, when Christ will deliver up unto God all of the kingdom. Are you with me on that scripture? Well, that scripture is not so strong in the Greek as to deliver up to him, but is to, is to actually is to hand over to him. So in other words, it fits with the thought, it's not so strong as what's, uh, in the, uh, what's related to us in the translation of the Greek in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in that it, is, it leaves room for the same thought in Revelation chapter 21 or 22, where we're reading that they together rule. Are you with me on that thought? No. He's left, he's left his realm, the realm of intercession, Jerry. He's left that realm, and now he's taken on the role of king. He, he is here on this throne as king, not as intercessor, as ruler and reign. And with him, his. This bride is representative of his kingdom. His servants are representative of his servants, <laughs> of his, of his uh, people that are a part of his bride. And you'll see here, you note that this throne that I'm speaking to you, uh, that I just read of in uh, chapter 22, verse 1, it takes the place of the ark in the Old Covenant. Why? Well, the ark is the place where God was. His, uh, he abode above and be the two cherubim between them. And he was hid, right? And he, could, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, approachable. And uh, he, he himself was Yahweh, and he was uh, Almighty, and he, and he reigned over Israel from above the ark. Well, when, when we come into this new heavens and new earth with a new Jerusalem descending down to earth, to men and to the bride, we find this new dynamic uh, of a throne with God and the, Fa the God the Father and the Son on it, and this in, a, in type replaces the ark. The very same concept. Also, uh, Psalm chapter one. Psalm chapter one is a perfect depiction of, of this dynamic. He's planted by the rivers of living water. His leaf will not wither. You know that scripture, Psalms of chapter one. It's a perfect description and fulfilling of those scriptures there too as well. I'm using some Old Covenant terms because we are familiar with Old Covenant terms, and so I thought I would bring them out for whoever uh, might, might find them interesting. They're all, of course, uh, types. Verse 2, In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there a tree of life. So you see why I put a tree of life on both sides of the river? So I'm just, well, there's only one tree of life. Well, I just, I'll remind you, there's, a, uh, there's a, lots of trees that are, uh, one I'm thinking of is a banyan tree in uh, India that have one system of roots, and they break up everywhere. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but uh, th th there's no, there's no, uh, no uh, conflict in the understanding that there's a tree of life on, on both sides of the river, and it being the tree of life. And it's in, uh, was there the tree? In the midst of the street of it, in the midst of the street, this is more like in the middle of the, the city. In the midst is the middle. So I tried to give you more of a flavor of this drawing being in the middle of the city. As you're having, the nations are coming in, the people are coming in to this city, and they're going to the midst where it, wherein they can partake of the tree of life. Literally. <clears throat> and then it says of that tree that there's 12 manner of fruits and they yield. 12 manner of fruits means a different fruit every month. Not the same fruit over and over and over, but a different fruit every month, 12 months a year. So it, it yields, it's, it's abundant, right? It's by the river of living water, right? It's crystal clear. And then it goes on to say, and yielded her fruit every month. Well, every month is, a, is an allusion to the moon because there's 12 times a year. So it's 12 moons, 12, 12 new moons, 12 months. 
So the time is still going. It isn't that there isn't a moon and there isn't a sun and there isn't a stars. It's just that there isn't a moon or star that, ha that there's any purpose for it in this city. This city has the light of God, the brightness of God in it 24-7. And when you're way far away from this city, it's going to look like a light on a hill. It's not going to illuminate the whole universe. The further you get away from this city, the less light there would be. Are you with me? So as you approach it on your pilgrimage, more and more light, brilliant, more and more brilliant as you get closer in your pilgrimage to this new city. Yeah, I bring it out in my lesson. <coughs> If I don't get the answer, if I don't question, get, put the question, put the answer to the question, go ahead and ask me again. So this, there's these leaves and fr or fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were the healing of the nations. So we know that the leaves of, these, of this tree will have something to do with the nations being healed. In other words, there's some healing power within these leaves. Well, you might say, how is it there is any leaves... How is there any need for any healing in the new Jerusalem in the, after this new heavens and the new earth been created and all, all the death and hell has been done away with? How is it that there could need, be need of any healing into these nations? How could that be literally taken? Well, the way it can be literally taken is that they are in the flesh. This answers somewhat to your question, Kathy. These are in the flesh. The nations are in the flesh. Those that are in the heavenly city who are citizens and subjects inside the heavenly city, the bride, they have no need of any of the leaves. They have no need of any of the fruit. But the nations of the earth and those populated spaces from there out will all have need of healing. Not in the sense of, not in the sense of, of uh, sin, but in the sense of uh, they have a, a material covering that has a, it's not, ha, doesn't have an eternal, uh, it's not an eternal substance. It's not, this is not an eternal substance. Here, get your mind around this. If Adam would have continued to eat of the tree of life when he was in there, he would have never died. That's what I'm saying. That's to put it in a different way. He was, he was made good, not just good, very good. He was made to last forever. And he would have lasted forever if death and sin hadn't entered in and the curse. But in this dynamic, there's no death, no sin, no curse, but yet there still is flesh like Adam had. And, less, and that's the reason he put the tree of life in the garden. So that he could live eternally. In the flesh. He's going to live eternally anyway, right? Without the flesh or with the flesh, you're going to live eternally. But here it is. The dynamic is to live in the flesh, to populate the flesh, to populate God's physical world. Gosh, these things are so wondrous and amazing. I just, I just, love, the, the, I just love the way God thinks. How, you know, the Word says to pray that you, might be, that you might see mysteries in the Word of God. That was David's prayer in Psalm, I think, 119. It's been, my prayer is that God reveals to me the mysteries of His Word. Why? Because when He reveals His mysteries, He reveals Himself. You can't help but see His mysteries and have a wonder and awe for Him, can you? What a wonderful, awesome God. They just don't even begin to describe Him. And so, verse 4, no, verse 3, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. So over here in the verse 3 of chapter 21, we find that this, this dynamic was given unto men. This dynamic outside of the, of the city was given unto men, and, and to these men there were certain promises and attributes of the of the new creation of the heavens and the earth. But now we turn to just focusing on those that are residing and living in this city. And those that are residing and living in this city are called servants. These are called men 
These are called servants. The bride, no, the bride and overcomers are here in the city. They don't need the tree of life because they have an ever-bubbling-up river of living water that verses to these. It weren't the bride that are yet in the flesh that haven't, that haven't got a glorified state. And there's a point that I make, and see that I don't answer this question also. And, you know, I know where your mind is right now. I know your puzzling thoughts. See if I don't answer that question inside my lesson. If I don't, run it back at me. Because I'm trying to go through the lesson, right? I'm trying to hold true to my word here. <laughs> Verse 4. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. This is an allusion to, to the high priest, isn't it? The high priest is holy unto the Lord that had the gold emblem on his forehead every time that he went into the Holy of Holies once a year. He put on this gold emblem that said holy unto the Lord. Here is not just once time a year, but every day and always. This is a name written on them eternally. And there shall be no light there and, the, and no need of candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord of God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever. For this is eternal then, there's no, there's no fallibility. There's no possibility of failing or falling. Why? Because they're glorified. They have taken on the likeness of God. And I'll explain that a little more in the lesson. See, I'm trying to get to the lesson, right? Like I'm not in the lesson. <laughs> and, and there's good that. I'm going to tie it all together, hopefully. Verse 6, And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God, the holy prophets, sent his angel to show unto the servants the things which must shortly be. Okay. Let's go to the notes. Like I said, it's a little bare sheets and a little bit of revelation. The first paragraph says, The new earth and the new Jerusalem are now manifest as the completion of God's previous plans. Right? This is a complete... We see in Revelation chapter 21 22, we see His completing of whatever it was in His plans. We saw some of His plans... Completed in recreation in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. But now we see the fullness of all of his past plans here in this final restoration of all things. It's finally complete. Order out of chaos. This is complete order out of complete chaos. The old is done away with. The new now bursts upon the scene in Revelation 21 and 22. The heavens and the earth were divided, and now they are joined together in completeness. The heavens and the earth were divided. In Genesis chapter 1, I'm trying to, to, to share with you. Just I'm trying to, to take you type to anti-type, type to anti-type real quick. In Genesis, we find this separation between the earth and the heavens. And now they are joined together in completeness. Now the heavens and the earth are joined. Before they were separated, now they're put back together. The dry land is brought forth from the waters. Right? In Genesis chapter 1, the dry land is brought forth from the waters. Here, in this dynamic, the waters are done away with. There is no more sea. There is no more waters. Chapter 21. So here we have him separating the heavens and earth, have him separate the land. From the, now we have him putting it all back together in a new dynamic way and form. It's the other end of the spectrum from where Genesis is at. While the recreated earth was beautiful with its Eden being its jewel, the new heaven and the new earth are glorious and greater by far than the bride of Christ the new city in paradise. By far then the bride of Christ. The new heaven and earth are glorious and greater by far than, than the bride of Christ, the new city in the paradise. In other words, I'm comparing Eden to the earth restored, Eden being the jewel of the earth restored. Now I'm comparing this, this place, this new Jerusalem, the bride, I'm comparing it to the new heavens and the new earth. The restored earth was beautiful. 
and it's Eden most beautiful of all. How much more restored new heaven and earth is beautiful? Well, now with this touching diadem, its, its top, its pinnacle of diadem beauty is found here in the new city. Before the first Adam were brought the animals, and, they, and these he discerned a name for. You know, he looked at everyone, he saw their characteristics, and he decided this is a that. This is a cow. This is a pig. This is whatever. And his names were descriptive of them and their personalities. Now here, the second Adam has brought all before him, all men. All men have been brought before him, and he discerns them holy or not, righteous or not, and gives them each accordingly. He gives you a name according to what it is that you are. Just as the first Adam judged all the animals, now in this dynamic we have no mention of animals. There's no mention of any animals in this. So, so now, though in this dynamic, there is a second Adam, and he brings all before him, and he judges each and discerns each as they are and gives them accordingly. In the first Adam, none were found to rule with him. Remember? None were found worthy to rule with him. And so God built out of him a worthy, Eve. And so it is in the new earth and in the, and in the new heaven, a bride and her city is built and adorned for the second Adam. Can you get it? I'm not talking about can you get the, the type. I'm can you get the, the duplicity or the dual, the dual personality of the bride. He builded, because that's the word that he used as the new creation is that he builded, Ephesians chapter 6. It is that he, the new creation means a, a building, being built, something dynamic, something that's going on. He builded a bride out of us. Not one of us is his bride. We all together are his bride. He builded a bride, and he did that in a quiet place without hammer as Solomon's temple was built and quarried out. He did it out in Hades. He built a bride for Christ. And in the same manner has he built for Christ another bride, this city. And he is presenting it. He's bringing it and presenting it unto his bridegroom. Just as Eve was built out of the rib and brought to him and presented unto him. That one was naked. This one is adorned. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Created living souls in earthly bodies were first employed and failed, but now resurrected new creations in glorious bodies, having overcome the world, now rule eternally. Big difference. Okay, moving on. The fullness or the meaningfulness of all the Word of God recorded for us will manifest after this judgment, the great white throne judgment of sin and death, and the cleansings of the universe, and then we shall see the fullness of the meaning manifest here in this coming down of the bride. We'll see the fullness of the meaning of the Scriptures in the meaning, fullness of all the meanings of the Word of God. For example, in the, in we have in partial complete, completeness the Word of God as it relates to man's heart. It was hard, he softened it. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he has written on the heart the Word of God to some extent. But in this day, he will have, by the power of the Holy Spirit, wrote on every man's heart the Word of God. There is no need of commandment. There's no need of thou shalt and thou will not. These people will not be walking by, by, uh, by a list of commandments on the earth. These nations, these nations to a man will know the Lord. To a man, each one will have in the fullness of that Scripture, both in Jeremiah 33 and both in Hebrews chapter 8, both of those Scriptures will be manifest in their completeness at the time that this transpires, in that there, 
Hearts will have the God, God's word written on them. That's how they can not walk. That's how they do not walk in sin. The wonderful thing. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no command or law or penalty or ritual practiced then by these nations. But there is this pilgrimage that is ongoing. Pilgrimages are what we mentioned is that they come up and the, the nations bring their gold into or their, their, both their glory and honor into it. Verse 24. There's these pilgrimages that are ongoing. There's a pilgrimage that, that has to do with partaking of the tree of life and the leaves for their healing. There's those pilgrimages, pretty important pilgrimages if you are walking in the flesh. If you have a fleshly body that has some need of replenishment, some kind of sustenance of, of eternal life put into it. There's no distinction here now on this earth or between the nations. There's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. They're all, uh, all know God. The kings of the earth and all their subjects are of one mind. There being now then king of kings of kings, and these of the earth, recognizing their being inferior to the resurrected kings, are in the state without jealousy or dread, now bringing their gifts up unto the throne of God. What is it that I just said? Does anybody know? <laughs> I feel like I just said something that nobody heard. These, see these here? These are servants. See the halos around their heads? That to me represents they are servants. See, these are kings, little k, kings of kings. These are kings. Okay? These are kings of the nations, bringing in their glory and bringing the honor into this new Jerusalem. These are servants. These are kings of kings. These are kings of these kings. These are over these kings. These rule and reign with Christ over these kings. Are you with me on that? And these kings will bring gifts into the holy city. There are three different ages or dispensations represented in the book of Revelation. One, there is Redeemer, Intercessor, seen now on the throne at the side of God. Chapters 1 through 3. These are three, genera three dispensations or ages that I'm going to articulate for you that are brought out in the book of Revelation. The first one is the age that we're living in. This age that we're now a part of where Christ the, the Redeemer is intercessor sitting on the throne of God. The second, the second dispensation or the second age that's soon coming is this throne of judgment seat that's going to be set up in chapter 4. Chapter 4, a good way to understand that judgment seat is to look up the word tribunal. It's a portable uh, judgment seat or stand wherein a judge or judges rule over a certain case that is not a not in the uh, auspices or in the region of where the court and the judgment usually is carried out. It's out in the field, so to speak. Generals might have a tribunal, and, and they might rail against some and rule against some of the, the, uh, the soldiers in the field. This is, this is with the meaning of the throne that's being set up in chapter 4 of Revelation. It's the meaning of it is that it is a tribunal. A tribunal doesn't mean it has to be more than one. It can be one. One can set in judgment on a tribunal. And that's the case. The lamb is the one worthy to judge. He's the one worthy to judge and open the seals. And he is on his throne, the throne of judgment. Not the throne of intercession and redeemer or beside the Father, but he's now on his throne, the tribunal throne of judgment, and that's the second part or the second age of the generation that is right before us. And this judgment seat that he sets on 
transfers into or translates into into the, uh, the, the throne of the king in the millennial period. Coming through the tribulation, the last part of the tribulation, the last of oh, the full tribulation, but through the end of the tribulation, into the millennial reign, the tribunal uh, seat or throne is here, part of the tribulation, but immediately when the tribulation over, the tribunal is over, the judgment seat is now replaced with or joined with the judgment seat and the throne of God. The, not the throne of God, but the throne of Christ as king of kings. His throne. He, he is given a throne now as king of kings, capital K, over little k's, by God in the millennial period, and he is rule and reign over the heaven and the earth during that period of time. So there's that transition between the tribunal and the king and kingship coming into his kingdom. That's two. And it goes, it, it, that period of time goes all the way through the end of the thousand years to the final judgments, to the end of chapter 20, Revelation 20. And then the third generation, not generation, but the third dispensation is this dispensation that I'm speaking to you of now. This is the third one. This is after the great white throne judgment. Now we have this third generation, the bride of Christ, that is to say the new Jerusalem city coming down from heaven from God and his throne. And this is after the old city is gone. After the old temple is done away with, and now we have this new Jerusalem. This city being the tabernacle of God. I think I wrote it up there. The tabernacle of God, the bride of the Lamb, and the paradise of God. I might also write up there, or I might not. Oh, the paradise of God. So we have this description. All these descriptions are one and the same thing. This is, this is what we have here. The servants are the resurrected and glorified. They are the glorified of the patriarchs before the law. They are the, they are the glorified of those that were under the law. The law didn't, the, there, was, there was no glorification brought about by the law, but there was glorification under the law through faith. And then the new covenant glorified. These are all residents of New Jerusalem, 1 Kings 10, 5 and 8, and Revelation 3, 12, speak in terms of those that will be, that will uh, be residents and rule and reign in this kingdom with Revelation 22, 3. <clears throat> As opposed to the nations. This city is set for us as the final resting place of men of living faith. They shall serve him. Serve him means, implies uh, there, there's an activity, not of idleness. And that being kingly as opposed to priestly work, not a servile work though. There's, no, there's not a priestly work that these servants are now to offer unto God. These are... This is, a servile, this is a service, but it's not servile, nor is it priestly. It's more kingly. In other words, you're not going to be slaughtering any animals. You're not going to be slinging any blood. None of that. All that's passed away. But there are, the fact that you are servants implies that there is servitude, and that's what we understand. That, that now fulfills the fullest of the original arrangement as spoken of by God. You remember the original arrangement? God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl there. There's no fish, there's no fowl here. In the new heaven and earth, there's no fish, there's no fowl. There's nothing mentioned in any of the new dynamic. There's no sea. There's no fish. There's no fowl. We're not, we're not, no longer, we're not rulers of, of the material. We're rulers of spiritual. 
We have, we have graduated. We've been exercised. We're now to rule and reign with Christ in a reality that goes way beyond that reality that was set forth before us in the Garden of Eden. So Genesis chapter 26, 126 says, take dominion over the earth. And that's, this is the completeness and the fulfilling of that purpose of God. Having then been made in his image, get this, having then been made in his image, now are peculiarly, through the resurrection in Christ, partakers of his likeness. We're no longer made in his image now, through the resurrection in Christ, we're partakers of His likeness. Big difference between being born or made in a, created in a living soul, but being resurrected in the power in Christ in His likeness. Big difference. And now then, not ruling or having dominion over annual animals, but over all other subjects of His kingdom all other subjects being at least these nations. And I would suggest to you more. As it was to be then from Eden over all outward, so it is now from the paradise of God over all his creation. In other words, Eden was the center point of all the earth where everything was supposed to have its genesis and from it its focus from it. Now it is here in the New Jerusalem, the bride, this this sanctuary, this place of God, this tabernacle of God, not sanctuary, but this tabernacle of God is from here outward now, those that are with him will rule and reign. The new Adam and Eve rule from Eden over all the universe. No more trial or testing for these are found eternally faithful and are glorified. From Eden, I'm typing this, okay? This is, this is actually the new Jerusalem, but I'm calling it Eden. It is Eden restored and on steroids, right? But you understand what I say when I say it's outward from here, from Eden. And there's no more testing, no more trials, for all of these have already been found eternally faithful. And as Christ was resurrected infallible and glorified, so his bride is resurrected, infallible and glorified. Glory filled, filled with God's glory. And whatever's filled with God's glory remains filled with God's glory. There's no room for anything else. And whatever the service is, it is not likely that, it, that it'll be that of teaching. Because as I said, the word of God has now been written upon all the hearts of all men. So there's two kinds of bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 40 through 49 gives us the understanding there's an earthly and a spiritual, both millennial and eternal. There's a millennial body and there's an eternal body. Chapter 21 opens and reveals to us the general state of man in the natural body upon the earth and what conditions there then shall be. There shall be sun and moon and darkness and light and as a natural man he will need sleep. But in chapter 22, we're revealed the more spiritual body in the resurrection. It reveals the privileges of the risen and in inglorious bodies. Reveals the privileges of the risen and in glorious bodies, the inhabitants of the city of the bride. There is no need of sun, neither moon, for darkness, as these do not need of sleep, and nor one of light, as the glory of God and the Lamb is the light thereof. We neither take, we never give and take a marriage, we'll neither die, we'll neither, we'll neither need rest or sleep. We'll be as the angels are in regard to those things. The resurrection from among the dead and rapture of the living by Christ will break up the church as an institution upon the earth. This is an understanding for this group who has a lot of their roots in Hebraic understanding. And it's simply, I add this to this lesson simply for our benefit and for your benefit, in that God breaks up the church, so to speak, as an institution upon the earth. 
in the resurrection from among the dead in the rapture. How so? That he might clear the way to resume the work that God had for the Jews. For he never yet, never yet as today, has never made, never had, and never likely to have two elect peoples upon the earth at the same time under, under different covenants and different laws. See? Even though there's some who think there are today, there's one covenant today, that's the new covenant, that God is operating in and for and with to accomplish to call out a people for His name's sake. He's not operating in the old covenant He's not operating, and that's why he did away with all of that old covenant stuff while he's doing the new covenant stuff. But when he has the rapture and the resurrection, now he makes the way to bring back upon the earth that old covenant, or not the old covenant, but the old covenant renewed on the earth that will now be for those, the Jews, to fulfill the calling that he had before, the suspension of their calling during the time of the calling out of the Gentiles for his namesake. Are you with me? Okay, that's just an explanation as to what's going on and what, what is God doing here. He looks like he's taking, he's taking all out of the blood and he's putting the back of the blood circuit sacrifices. He's putting circumcision, he's taking circumcision out. He's doing Sabbath, he's not doing Sabbath. What's he doing? I'm trying to show you what he's doing. He has a covenant. He has got a plan. He suspended one. He started another. It's this one that he's on. It's this one he's focused on. But it's this one he'll pick up again when he's finished with this one. This one renewed. This one renewed over here. The old covenant of Moses renewed in the Ezekiel's temple and covenant. For he never, if we compare the millennial reign, I'm 10 minutes past, if we compare the millennial reign of Christ from the heavenly reign, realm, if we compare the millennial reign of Christ from the heavenly realm or the eternal reign of God and the Lamb in New Jerusalem with the regulations appointed unto Israel and Jerusalem during that millennial reign, Ezekiel chapters 40 through 44, we see both resemblances and differences. So in other words, if you want to take and compare in Scripture the millennial period of time, the thousand years of Christ ruling on the earth, and you're going to take this, this time that comes after the millennial reign and compare those two back to, that, to Ezekiel's millennial earthly reign, then you will find some resemblances and then some differences. In Ezekiel's temple, there are blood sacrifices still. There are carvings and engravings of angelic figures on wall and curtain. God still conceals himself within the holiest place. There are laws that the priest must continue in it as it relates to clothes, food, marriages, teaching, judgments of different kinds, including the defilement of the dead. There is both sin and atonement. There are feasts, Sabbath, and the daily lamb sacrifice. The city and the sanctuary are separate. In this, day, in this, we have noted that there is no separation. There is no temple. That this is all one throne, one place, one God, and there is no, there's no, none of these dynamics that we see on the earth in the Jewish uh, period of time when they take preeminence in the earth. There are some resemblances, but there's many differences. But one precedes the other. And we, of this age and dispensation and covenant, have an understanding imparted to us as to what God is doing. We should have no conflict with it. We shouldn't be contrary to it. We understand that God's fulfilling His promises to the Jews. He's finishing a work with the Jews that He begun, a promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. We see that. And other, and other such unfilled prophetic worlds, words such as there 
uh, there remains seas of water. You know, and during the millennial period of time, there are still seas. We have the restructure, matter of fact, of the, of the seas, right? The Dead Sea no longer is dead. And now we have out of the temple, we have out from under the temple throne, we have the water, the living water that runs down into the, into the lake, the Dead Sea, right? And makes it alive again. And along it grows fruit trees in abundance. See, there's a similarity, isn't there? But in this one, this river of living water doesn't flow out into the nations. This river of living water is, is constricted to its own city. And that's all. You have to come here to partake of the tree of life or the river of life. Are you with me? There's some resemblances, some similarities, and then a lot of things that are different. One is in a step of progression. In the step of progression, that millennial period speaks of this time, only this time is much more amplified in peace, goodness, its finality, the doing away of sin and death. There you die at 100, here you never die. There there's pain and sorrow, here there's no pain or sorrow. You see the progression? Here, there was a liver, river of living water that people still died when they partook of it. Here's a river of living water that if they partake, they will never die. It's resemblances, similarities, but multiple differences as well. Blah, 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 blah. You know, I st I'm stopping, but you could continue here. I could just carry on. The, yeah, the whole city is the holy of holies. The whole 1,376 miles that way by 1,376 miles that way, all of it is holy. Yeah, you can't live on, you can't reside in this city unless you have a glorified body. That's the, that's, that's the contingent for, for living and being a resident in this body. Having a house, abode here. Now these, this guy right here, I like this guy. I met him last time I was on the earth. I met him. I said, come on and stay with me at my house during your pilgrimage right here. And I'll go up with you and will administer to you from the table of showbread, meaning the tree of life and the river of water. And when you go back, we'll say adios. They're coming and going. These are, we as servants are residents. These are subjects. Subjects under the residents, the rulers, and those that rule and reign. These are the nations that are repopulating the earth and all of those other arenas in the universe. God is not superfluous. He did not make a Saturn just for somebody could stare through a microscope or a telescope, I mean, and to look at it. All of the whole universe, everything that's out there is to be, it's purposeful, and God intends to use it. Each one of those stars represented an angel and his dominion. Now each one of those stars will represent a person and their dominion. Didn't he say he would, he would give you a star? <laughs> it's amazing what God has in store for man. I hath not seen, ear hath not heard. Neither has even entered into the heart, into the heart of man what God has in store for him. It's an amazing story that goes on and on and on where you can, you can build off of this in every arena and find the wonder of God. I made myself notes that I think that you'd probably find interesting, but as I said, I am finished for today. This is, I, I, I don't know if I've ever stopped that short. Huh? No, 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 no. It, Okay. Well, well, you go ahead. I, I, I didn't mean that I didn't have time for a question. I'm just mean I'm finished with my lesson. It's about 10 minutes longer than I intended it. Yeah. Here, here, here's, here's the challenge. The Word of God doesn't give us every detail, but it does give us enough information that if we are spiritually discerned enough or God reveals it to us, or, we're, or we are so thirsty to understand and hunger after the truth in a certain area, he will give us the truth. 
Now, Daniel prayed and fasted for 21 days in the Old Covenant, and God gave him mar- marvelous uh, eternal understandings and uh, understandings that related to his uh, children. And so, to answer your question, even though there's not, there's not anything specific there, it, let me put it this way. There's a tree that has more than one part, and a tree has more nobler parts than another. In other words, fruit is more nobler than the leaves, or more noble than the leaves, right? Okay, so the, these servants are representative of, these glorified, resurrected servants are representative of the fruit of a tree. The, the flesh is more, has more to do with the, with the leaf. It has more to do with the nation than it has to do with the fruit. So what I'm saying is the flesh is, is not as, it's, it's obviously unglorified. And so therefore it's corruptible. When you are glorified, you're incorruptible. And if you're, in, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you're incorruptible, you no longer need to have anything that, make, that works toward incorruptibility. And it's not to say that you wouldn't partake, but you wouldn't be doing it so that you wouldn't corrupt. For out of you flows a river of living life. The Holy Spirit, in the fullness of the meaning of that, in the fullness of the meaning of the baptism, because that's in the resurrection, then the fullness of that, you have no longer any need of the tree of life or the river of life. You are the fruit of the tree of God. But then there are those things that are not as noble as that. And those are risen, but not glorified. Resurrected, but still in the flesh. Still have the body. Okay? The earthly body. Not necessarily have they got blood, but they have resurrected bodies and they are flesh. So when, we, when we're talking about who these people are, they are those that are flesh. Be they resurrected, all will be resurrected, but not all glorified. These are glorified. These are resurrected. These are the less noble part of the tree. That's right. And those that are outside are of a lesser risen quality than those that are on the inside. But on the inside, where they are at, it's possible for them to go in and eat and maintain eternal life in an incorruptible type of state. They didn't get it in the first resurrection. They didn't get glorified. It's just another, it's just another great spance in understanding between the resurrection life and, and the gift of eternal life. It's another big, big gap where the church has put them together and made them nothing. This is nothing. We'll get that. I'll get that. I don't care. I walk like hell the rest of my life and I'll still get this. They haven't understood that God has justice that will prevail before His mercy. Justice will rule. That's why the judgment seat comes. That's why He judges all under the law. And then once that's done, He completes it, and then that's the way it will be. And if you suffered loss at the judgment, you'll suffer a loss eternal. Can be no other way. But it was through grace and mercy that we obtained unto whatever we might obtain to in this life. You'll never be a resident. You'll always be the nations outside, outside the, the kingdom. Outside this, this now being the bride. This now being the... The whole universe will be the kingdom of God. But this is his Garden of Eden, his paradise, his tabernacle. This is where he abides. This is where his, Jesus' servants are with him, and they, wherever he goes... They go with Him. This is that place, that residence, uh, where I am, you will always be with me. This is this place. Not all will go there. Not all will have a part there. All that survive, all that survive the judgment 
and have eternal life, have access. That's what I mean. If your name's found in the eternal book of life, then you have access in here, but you're, you're not have, you don't have residence, and you're not as the resurrected, glorious of Christ. You're not a servant. You're a subject. Well, some say, oh, that's okay. Any, just if I get in, if I just get in. Not really. Not really. Not, you're in, not in your right mind. You're thinking like a dog in heat. You're not, you're not in your right mind. You, at the moment, things don't matter. But when you have your right mind, things will matter. It'll matter a great deal. That's why there's the, the eye get this big as saucers and the teeth gnash together and the tongue and the screams and the hollers. It's because there's going to be such a revelation of the great loss. And these are those that are still have an inheritance in the kingdom. <laughs> These are those that are still have eternal life that gnash and eyes get wide. That's not those that are condemned to hell. Yeah, there was a chance. That, that's the, that's, isn't that the severe... Isn't that really what we fear? That God gave us a chance and we know it and we denied it? Isn't that really our greatest fear? It is mine. That's it. That's these. See, they get in by the smell of smoke. They, they're, they're, they were found wanting, and, and uh, their, their works were lacking, and they had nothing. They built nothing. They did nothing. They weren't good servants. They made it in. Whoo, their name was written in the Lamb's Book of Eternal Life. But this is as far as they go. They're not glorified. They have bodies. They, are, they have bodies. They're risen from the dead. They have eternal life, and they can partake. But they are subjects. They will not rule, they will not reign, and they will not be in the presence of God. See, these behold his face always. That's why I got them up here, see? <laughs> these, the promises to these is they'll behold his face always. And there'll be pillars in his kingdom, and they will never leave. They ain't going to want to leave. You ever get it to here, you'll never want to go nowhere else. <laughs> No, you won't even have a thought. I wonder what so-and-so's... I wonder... You'll not have a thought. You ever get here. See, I talked to you about oneness last week. That's what this is. This is oneness. You know, the, the Lamb and the Father? Oneness. This? Oneness. This is what God looks for, is this right here. Firstborn sons of God. Oneness. This is what He looks for. See, it's only right that a father grant unto his victorious son rulership. Is that right? If I had if Luke went out and fought a battle for me and won the battle, would I not make him over? Would I, would I not give him rule and reign over him? And if my son had those that were faithful unto him that ruled with him or fought with him and defeated the enemy with him, and he wanted to reward them and make them joint heirs with him, could they not do that? Could he not do that? That's what you have here. That's the dynamic you have here. That's why these are excluded. Because they weren't warranted, worthy. They didn't go out. They didn't fight. They didn't do what God asked them to do. They didn't join. There are those that Christ said, if there's any among you that fear, then let him go home. Before the Israelites went to battle. That's who. They, any of you got fruits you're worried about, new plants, you got a wife, you just married, you got, go home. See? It's, the, it's those prophets that came to Paul and said, and bound him up in his own girdle and said, everywhere you go, I see that you're going to face all kinds of truth. Let it come. And even death, I'm ready. He didn't take that warning and say, oh gosh, I guess I, I better go over here. See? And when he, the Gideons, when they were invited him to go on home, those that had anything in them took courage. And those that went home are here. Those that rose up, Gideon, Gideon's right here. Abraham's right here. Moses is right here. Paul's right here. <laughs> this is where we want to be. This is, this is our heart's prayer. Oh, God, let us be here. Help us, strengthen us. Hey, these are like men as we are. They have the same passions as Elijah. He had the same passions as I've got. He's just a man. But God did a work in him. Let's hunger and thirst after God that we could be found worthy to be a partaker in His kingdom. In Jesus' name. Jerry, sing a song. Let us go. Okay.
See, what good does it do for me to quit? Right here, Jerry. Right here. That's these. You see, see, a whoremonger didn't want to start, stop whoremongering. A covetous man didn't want to stop coveting. A greedy man didn't want to stop being greedy. A liar didn't want to stop being lying. A defrauder didn't want to stop defrauding. Oh, he's not a defrauder anymore. He's not a liar, not a whoremonger now. But it excluded him from this. That's the Word of God. Let no man think that if he is a whoremonger or an abuser of men, they are infinite, let him think that he has any part in the kingdom of Christ. It doesn't mean that he has no eternal life. It doesn't mean that he can't come and partake in the future because his name was found in the Lamb's book of life. But he's only that, a subject. Yeah, what was your crime? I was a whoremonger. What excluded you from being in here? I was a liar. I was a thief. I was a cheat. I I wouldn't give it up. And now I'm paying eternally for my apathy, for my lethargy, for my not overcoming the world. These men, all these men had the same temptations, the same trials, the same tests, and the same sins. (laughs) Same sins. Amen. Amen. That's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's what he said in Ephesians chapter 5. It's what he said in Galatians chapter 5. That's exactly what he said, Jerry. They won't be a partakers in this. Well, you can't say, the mistake is to say they're going to go to the eternal lake of fire. That's the mistake. Once your name is written in that book, I would suggest to you I'm still of the mind that you can't get out of that book. And some might say, well, what about Judas? Well, I don't think his name was ever in that book. But if it was, then it proves then your name can be blotted out of the book. Take it as you will. Doesn't matter to me. Whatever's true and right before God. He can blot out if he wants to blot out. Or he can write in if he wants to write in. But I don't know what he's going to do exactly, but from the word I see, the eternal life means it's a gift and you can't lose it. Therefore, I don't think Judas ever got it. But if he did get it, he lost it. Okay? Well, then I can't say that you can't lose it, can I? No, I can't if that's the case. But I don't think that's the case. But who wants to try it? Who wants to walk a line so close to find out? Not me. 